Today, we are going to be diving into item 36201. So we are going to explore a little bit more of the platform that we may not have done in the first webinar, which was item 36101. So the item 36101 webinar gave a basic overview of the platform and addressed item setup and maintenance. So if you hadn't had a chance to see that and would like to, I will go ahead and drop the link in the chat. But with that being said, we are very excited to dive deeper into today's content. So for those of you have, who have never been here before, my name is Danielle. I am a supplier wiki researcher. So I help organize and research some of the content that you see. And then leading our content today is the incredible Ali Trong, our lead supplier wiki researcher. You can find Ali doing a little bit of everything, whether it's like eBooks, cheat sheets, newsletters, which shameless plug, Ali has recently revamped our newsletter and it is just incredible. There's good resources, news articles, some good humor and fun little supply activities that can be found in it. So if you haven't already signed up, I highly encourage you to do so. Ali and the team have done an incredible job at just uh, creating a great experience for the reader. Wow, I wasn't expecting all that hype this morning, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's very deserving. Okay, so moving on, as we go through item 36201, some topics you can expect to see throughout the webinar. First being a quick overview of what item 360 is, what it is used for, and just a brief overview of the platform. Then we'll go through items and inventory. This is going to be a reference to the Supplier One platform. We'll be going through some similarities that we see with that platform and then with item 360. Then we'll move through how to do a complete setup in item 360, some best practices. And finally, we will end it off with a Q and A at the end. So please submit any questions that you have along the way. All right. So here are a few FAQs that we typically get during webinars. So first being, will we be getting a copy of the slide deck? Yes, absolutely, 100%. You can expect to see the PDF version of the slide deck as well as the recording of the webinar appear in your email inbox in about three to four business days. So don't worry about trying to take notes or screenshots of any of the slides. We'll be getting all those resources to you, like I said, in about three to four business days. And then secondly, what is the best way to ask a question? At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat tab and then you'll see a Q&A tab. So the chat tab will be a great place to submit any insights or just to engage in conversation throughout the webinar. And then the Q&A tab has two little speech bubbles. And this is where we ask you to please submit any questions that you may have related to the content as I'll be able to monitor them and then tee them up for Ali for the Q&A time at the end. Okay, so last thing before we get into the content, if you are new to our webinars or have never heard of Supply Pike, we are a Northwest Arkansas-based software company who helps suppliers reduce revenue loss by detecting, detect, detecting <laughs> compliance issues and fighting them through business logic and automation. We do this in a lot of different ways and with multiple different retailers like Walmart, Target, Amazon, and Kroger. And just a little shout out, we work with a lot of great suppliers across the box in almost every product category. We have some of them up here today, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. And if your logo is not up here, we always like to say that we would love to see it at some point. We love to work with suppliers to help reduce revenue loss and win back money owed. And we would love to do that for you. And with that, I will hand it over to Ali. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. Great introduction. Um, wanted to just call out really quickly. I know Danielle said she was going to send the item 360 101 webinar, um, and that will be a recording and a slide deck. She'll send that in the chat here. But I also wanted to call out another resource for Danielle to share in the chat. If you didn't join us, I believe it was either last week or two weeks ago on the 15th of February, we had One World Sync join us and we talked with their um, chief product officer um, about content creation. So that webinar is has already happened. You can go find the recording on Supplier Wiki and you can download the um, the slide deck, but there are two uh, great webinars that are coming your way that you can join live. I would highly suggest going and signing up for these today. We had over, I believe it was 180 
registrants in um, that particular webinar or rather attendees. So it was a packed house. Randy answered a lot of questions. Stacy also was answering questions um, and it was really strong content. If you're, you know, in this webinar today about item 360, it makes sense for you to join these or either share them with your team if it makes sense for them to be on the content management and delivery webinar or content optimization. So stick around for those. They are coming um, here at the end of March and early April. These are going to be really awesome webinars, and I'm excited to attend these and learn more as well. All right, now let's get into item 360. Um, just a quick overview of kind of what that, that looks like and how you use that at Walmart. I did want to kind of insert in a disclaimer here. So as Danielle mentioned, we have solutions at Supply Pike for helping with revenue loss. Um, when it comes to item management, we don't have a solution for that. Um, that is something that is out of our wheelhouse. We deal with revenue loss, but we do touch um, some of the areas where if you're not setting your items up correctly or doing maintenance, they can kind of turn into a revenue loss opportunity, whether that's in the form of an OTIF fine or a SWEP charge or a uh, AP deduction. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to call out that we can help point you to helpful resources, um, whether that is you know internal resources in the Walmart um, help docs or finding a provider who can help you with that. So wanted to call that out. So first off, what is item 360? Item 360 is a Walmart platform. So it's within Retail Link and it's designed for suppliers to create and update items sold in stores and on walmart.com. So it can serve as a couple different things. I will say when it comes to import, there are some different caveats. Um, so before you get into item 360 and start executing something, make sure what item 360 supports is within what you're trying to do. And then another call out here is that Walmart has now fully integrated the store and online systems into a one-stop shop for item management. You can also check on Walmart help docs within retail link and we can kind of send some of those, um, but it's really easy to find. You can actually Google their help docs. Um, they're uh, available there um, to kind of understand what's, what, what is available in that item management tool that is item 360. So some key terms that we'll talk about today that we wanna make sure um, everyone understands is GTN and UPC, GDSN, One World Sync, and Works Compliance. So these kind of cover different areas and we'll get into those now. So what is a GTN, what's a US UPC, and what are the difference? If you guys are in the retailer world, even for a day, you will know that there's a lot of jargon and a lot of acronyms. Um, we have some of those outlined on supplierwiki.com. I'm sure Danielle can send that resource. Um, but I would also highly recommend if you need kind of a supplemental resource to remember some of these things or kind of get them sorted out. Um, besides just the slide deck, we have an item setup cheat sheet that's available that Danielle can send as well. So I'm making her do a lot of work in the chat, but be sure to check those out as I'm talking through this. So technically there's not necessarily a difference between a GTN and a UPC. They're one in the same, but depending on the retailer you're working on, working with, or the context, you may be asked to use one or the other. Um, some other terms that may kind of be used interchangeably. They have slightly different formats, um, but really serve work to serve the same purpose as a UPC, an EAN, an ISBN. These are all in the GTN world. So you want to make sure that you're understanding what context to use them in. And especially if you're using item 360, which one that you're supposed to use for particular products. And so just to kind of reiterate, a GTN is gonna be a number encoded into either a UPC, an EAN, or a IB, ISBN barcode. So make sure that you have those, those sorted and that you're setting those up correctly. And then let's talk a little bit about where GDSN falls in. So that is not another digit um, that you're going to be using for setting up products, but it is rather um, a network that helps exchange information. So it stands for the Global Data Synchronization Network, 
And essentially that data pool is going to enable you to have those UPCs and pull them and for them to be understood across um, different retailers and different products. So there's several different platforms for organizing that GDSN data, the attributes that are there. Um, there's One World Sync, uh, Sindago, EDI.com, and others. Um, want to call out here, we're going to talk a little bit about World, One World Sync, and this is not necessarily um, due to the partnership we're doing on webinars. This is kind of something we've talked about in other webinars. You can find them um, going back to 2022. Um, from the suppliers we've worked with um, and one of our collaborators, um, Dee Dee Washburn, she did a great webinar on um, item 360 and item setup. She is an expert on that. She really advocates for One World Sync and um, has found that tool helpful. So just calling out here, um, One World Sync is an example of something that you could use. Um, it's a data pool service. It has other applications, but essentially it's going to have all the information about your items and it can be published to any retailer. So if you are a uh, supplier that is in more than one retailer, this is a great suggestion because really you're just updating your item dimensions, your attributes, images in one platform, and then it can be pushed to other platforms. Like I said, there's other solutions like Syndigo. Um, I think there's a, a couple of others that have emerged, but you can kind of do that research. Um, one, World, one World Sync has been kind of around um, and has been used primarily by a lot of suppliers. So not all information we'll want to point out can be transmitted. Sometimes you have to upload images separately, um, but see what works best for you. Again, these are some more suggestions. This is what we've seen that has worked for the suppliers we work with. Um, some of the benefits that you would have is just putting all of your data into one place and having it you know, sent to Amazon, Target, et cetera. And it's storing all of your data in one place. Um, and it's data that may be siloed into different areas. So like I said, if you're starting out and you have one SKU and you're in one retailer, this probably won't make sense for you. But as you're scaling, this could be something that may be helpful for you in the long run. Um, another call out that I'll make is just you can let you can upload a lot of content and you're not doing this in a lot of different places. Thus, you're not making several small mistakes at different retailers. We see with some suppliers, item setup or item maintenance not doing that properly can cause some of those rebel revenue loss issues. It can be um, a root cause of something that is pervasive that your team just can't seem to get out from under when it comes to a deduction or a um, compliance fine. All right, another thing to call out is works. So there's a couple different things while you're plugging into using a item setup tool and that is works. This is what this is going to be crucial if you have something in your product that has a chemical, a pesticide, aerosol, battery, something that could potentially be harmful, you want to make sure that it's works compliance. So it's going to help you understand how to set up your item correctly, safely, and that it has the correct um, information for consumers to understand. Another thing that I'll mention here, if you are using works and you're trying to push the setup of a product or um, item maintenance, work on your, your works requirements a week before and submit those before you do that because it does take a little bit of time to come back. Again, if you don't have a chemical pesticide aerosol or battery, I would say you're good to go, but I would still check if you have a, if you're a new supplier or you just want to understand um, how your product fits into this and where you could potentially not be compliant, because that's going to be a huge roadblock to getting your, um, your products to particular retailers. All right, now we've kind of gotten that out of the way. Those are kind of the threads that you'll have to think about before you're getting into item 360. And with other tools on Retail Link, there is context that should be that you should have before you get in there and start working um, because you may, you know, not have that context and make a mistake or skip a um, important step and then in turn, you will either, your projects will be slowed down, you may not have the right information, and it may um, result in an issue with your, your merchant team or even a compliance fine. So with that out of the way, let's talk about how we access item 360. So currently, you can log into um, Retail Link. 
And then you'll go to your app section. And if item 360 is something you're going to use a lot, I would suggest starring it. So when it pulls up in the apps, you can star something and it will pop, it will populate um, on your homepage. Here you can see um, this um, sample uh, supplier. They have Fixit, Nova, OTIF, Squep dashboard. Um, but if they wanted to add that, they could pull that up and find item 360 on there or in the app section. So what is item 360 used for? Let's talk a little bit about the basics that we've covered um, in item 360 101, and then we'll kind of get into some of that more complex knowledge. So it is for items, uh, item setup is the foundation of the shipping process for uh, having your items in stores, online, having a product description, images. So item 360 is going to be used for something across all of the supply chain process. And those details are going to be helpful for you know, getting that into production, having it into tra transportation, and what your consumer is going to see and how they can access that product. So it's a really key um, part of being a supplier, setting that up correctly, because it will affect you in every, um, in every stage of the supply chain process. And then just to kind of extend um, that thought and put it into a metaphor, um, we use kind of the library book. So let's say that your, your product is a library book and it's in a library. If you're putting in the wrong information, like let's say you accidentally enter the wrong title or the wrong edition or the cover image or the color of the book, um, any of the attributes that could be used to search for the book, no one is going to be able to find it. The stores and online, we know the marketplace online as well as um, in stores is overwhelming for the consumer. And if they're looking for something, whether that is just using their eyes on the aisle that they think it should be on or using their phone and looking on, you know, let's say Walmart app where you can search for the aisle and find the product. If they can't find it, they're not going to shop there. They're not going to buy your product first and they may leave Walmart to go find you know, it on Amazon or on Target. And if you're not there, you have taken yourself out of that opportunity to um, be added to that, that consumer's cart. So if they can't find it, um, it's just going to sit on the shelf or maybe it's not even on the shelf because of the way that you've, you've entered that information. So filing a library book is really important when it means to getting the correct knowledge or checking out the right book. And that kind of multiplies and compounds when you are a supplier who has a product that you need to sell. You have goals and metrics that you need to hit at particular retailers. Today, we're talking about Walmart. And if a consumer can't find it or um, an associate can't stock that, it's going to create compounding problems as we all understand. So let's talk about some of the high level functions on item 360. I know we talked about um, setting up new products. That's important. You can also set up shippers and a couple other things that we'll talk about. You can also view your full catalog of brand assortment and understand that. You can help, you can work on maintaining and editing product details, um, updating those images. You can fix incorrect or dated pro product information. Um, so that's where you would correct that. You can update images, videos, and other rich media, which is key to um, having consideration from, from consumers, and then help overall execute product strategy for the Omnitanial now that walmart.com and in-store is kind of in the same spot. All right, now let's get into items and inventory. So we wanted to call out a couple of Walmart updates. So in the last few months, this was you know 2023 last year, um, feels like forever ago, but Walmart announced that they are going to be using um, new, the new platform Supplier One. So I'm not sure if all suppliers have access to this. I believe that this is slowly rolling out. Some suppliers were in the early adopter program, so they got to play around in that. Um, and essentially, Supplier One functions as a means of consolidating a few of the most important retail link apps into one platform. So the two that we're just calling out right here, um, and we'll have some more information on the next slide, is Nova, which is you know your, uh, your PO management, and then Item 360, which is what we're talking about today. 
So this is actually just a slide we grabbed from our supplier one webinar um, that Danielle can send in the chat. We cover kind of what that's looking like and how we're seeing that. There's a couple updates that are that have come out about that. So I would check your retail link news section, just kind of see those those announcements that Walmart's rolling out. They're kind of doing those slowly on supplier one. So here's what we have. You can see kind of the blurred out sections is order management is a tab. So it's going to be a, a function. It functions similar or um, the same as Nova. There's a claims and return scorecard. So it helps with returns reporting and then payments and charges. So um, payments of DSV orders only currently, and then some deduction details data and info. So it's it's a good group of things that are helpful for suppliers. Today, um, we won't be going too deep into the item and inventory section, um, but it's the way that we've observed it so far, it feels basically like a duplicate of item 360's functionality. All right, so if we were in supplier one, this is a little bit what it would look like. So if you are familiar, we'll show some screenshots of item 360 later, but this will feel really similar if you've played around or you've worked in item 360 before. Um, so there's four sub tabs under items and inventory, and it functions very similar to item 360. Um, item setup hub, there's a catalog so you can view your full product assortment, there's a maintenance hub, and then submissions manager. So what do those mean? Um, for the catalog, it's just lists out your, your supplier products by GTIN or UPC um, and the configurations and hierarchies that you would have by your Walmart item number when. So um, another tab in there, the setup hub. This is the tab that allows for suppliers to add item proposals, which is something we'll get into, item shippers, and then multi-boxes. So if you're not familiar with e-com, that's more of an e-com term. Um, and kind of think of it, it may be helpful to think of it if you're not familiar with e-com as much as like a PDQ. So it is something that ships in a box that has multiple boxes in it. That would still be a sellable GTIN. Um, the maintenance hub, this is a tab that is, it's more of the central hub for item maintenance. It's going to include um, updating product content. It'll give you details on site experience, item configuration, um, some of the details with supply chain in there. It will have DSV inventory, imagery, imagery and rich media. And then the fourth tab is the submissions manager. This tab contains tickets for submission types. So that can be either setting up a new item or doing um, maintenance on an item and making sure that that um, is getting approved. And then they're going to be organized by the statuses that they were in item 360 as well. Um, that is complete. That is also, also includes supplier action, which means the supplier needs to take action um, for it to be moved forward. Um, then there's also Walmart action required, which is um, essentially Walmart is reviewing that and they have to take action. There's no action for the supplier to take at that time. I will pause here. Um, we're going to go kind of into some of the, the details of uh, what this looks like. From what we have heard, and feel free to, if you've heard rumblings in the chat, share kind of with our supplier community that we've got on today. Item 360 is not necessarily supposed to be completely replaced. It seems like it's being integrated into this application and that's where it will live. Um, I haven't heard, um, nor have I you know, heard from any of the suppliers that we work with, that this is going to change in any direction. So we're keeping updated on that. We will be releasing more updates on our Supplier One webinar and in our articles and on our newsletter. So if you want to just have that um, rolling into your inbox or um, a part of some of the training that you're doing, I would just suggest signing up for the newsletter because we'll try to pop that in as soon as we hear about it. All right, enough of that caveat. Let's talk a little bit about the, the catalog. So here's what it looks like. Again, this is where you can start to search for your items. So let's say I was coming in and I wanted to, um, you know, look at these at a high level, you can either select them or search by um, your GTIN or UPC, and then kind of get a high level understanding of what's going on. So there's a couple of different ways to filter this. That's where I would start um, because as you can see, and if you are you know, a supplier at Walmart, you probably also have 
100, 350 pages or more or somewhere in between, but this is a lot of information at once. So you can kind of scroll through this and see different things like where it's available, the content quality, um, you know, other item details like the ID. So this is helpful just to kind of see a high level overview. Um, and a couple call outs I'll make is, you know, you can, you can download this report. Um, and then also there's a couple other buttons to toggle between, um, between those. So that's the high level view of that. And then this is the setup hub. We'll talk about this a little bit more and we'll actually kind of pretend like we're going through an item proposal. But you can see that this has a couple extra things um, than item 360. I believe this item proposal is pretty new um, to both item 360 and then you know how it's going to be added into supplier one. So this can actually help you propose items to your merchant for review um, before and get an official commitment. Now, I haven't heard many use cases on the item proposals. I would say checking with your merchant team before um, you're using this and just understanding the best practices and how each merchant team may use this differently. So that's a call out I would make there. And then other new setup items, you know, you can set up a individual item, you can set up a shipper, and you can also set up a multi-box. And it is really important to know what you're setting up before you start building it, because if you're building a shipper in an item um, workflow, it's not going to work. So I want to call that out there. And then this is just another dashboard item. So you can get your supplier quote, your DDSN publications, and then proposed items. So you would be able to see you know, what you've proposed and view those. And then here's the maintenance hub. There's a lot of different um, helpful things in there. Um, I have heard that the attribute finder can be helpful, um, especially if you're searching um, in different areas. I believe the catalog, you can also filter for attributes. Um, there are a lot of attributes that you can um, utilize in item 360. So. Another thing, we'll probably talk about this a little bit in the item setup section, but make sure you have that information before you get into um, setting up an item because it can be a really long process. And if you don't know that information, it's going to take even longer. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the maintenance hub. Like I said, you can look at your product content and the site experience and get some information, some insights into how to update that correctly. You can also manage trade items and item configurations and some of those details when it comes to warehousing or logistics. You can also manage cost um, at the win or the Walmart item number level. And then there's also some that may be helpful for others. Uh, you got imagery and rich media. So that's really helpful if you're updating your product content. And then if you are a DSV, how you can manage those items that ship directly from your facilities to customers. All right, and then this is the submissions manager. This is going to show all the submissions that you make. You can see this um, fig supplier did a lot of maintenance and these are the dates that they did them. And you can also see the status. So it's gonna feel really similar to other Walmart applications. Um, you have that, you know, Walmart action required, complete. Maybe it would say supplier action here, but this you can kind of sort through and see um, what you have in the queue and where, where it's sitting. You can also filter that or just show your the activity that you've made. So fun, fun ways to filter those as well. All right, now let's talk about doing a complete item setup in item 360. All right, this is going to look a little bit more like um, what we covered in item 360-101. These are some of the um, screenshots that are more like the item 360 before it was integrated into um, supplier one. So whichever one you're using should work. Um, I don't believe Walmart has officially released that, that you can use one or the other. So just wanna call that out. So let's say we're setting up an item. Um, when I say item, I mean something that is one unit. Um, it would not be like a parent UPC. It would be, you know, a mug or a one one juice box that's being sold, you know, as an individual SKU. So we're setting up that item. Um, shippers, 
So think of like your PDQ or maybe a display that you're doing um, that, you know, depending on the format of your product or where, where it's living in the store, that's where you would set up those. Um, and that's going to be something that's being shipped, you know, probably on a pallet um, and then can be, you know, transformed into something that you can pull off the shelf. So that retail ready packaging, um, or it could be something that's, you know, like living in action alley. So there's a couple of different ways you can think of that. Then multi boxes, let's think of those. Um, at, those, those are going to be primarily your e-com, um, your your e-com products, and that's just a box within a box. Um, but the different units are their own sellable units. So just making sure I'm doing this correctly, we've, we're moving to our shipper setup. So let's say we're doing a shipper setup. We, we've got our information ready and we're gonna put that in. So first you'll need to um, select your supplier name and contract number for your shippers. Um, this is a call out, especially if you have multiple BUs. Um, so make sure that you're selecting that correct supplier name and ID for your shippers and that, that contract numbers. And then you're going to put in your parent GTIN or your shipper prime. That can be a little bit confusing. Th those terms for the most part are like for like. So it's gonna be what distinguishes that particular um, product, that particular um, GTIN as a whole shipper. And it's going to go by that trade parent item or the parent GTIN. Oh, such a mouthful with all of these acronyms. So you want to make sure that that is correct. You don't want to put in a child GTN. You'll want to put in a parent GTIN. All right. And then just other information, you'll want to add your supplier stock ID and your parent name. Um, something I'll just call out here. If you have multiple um, BUs or you have different information, you may want to just have this in an internal document, either a spreadsheet um, or something of that nature to organize those so you can easily pull those um, and sort them. So just a quick call out there. And then you've got your PDQ dimensions and you have your child items. So this is where you, you'll enter every item within the shipper. Um, and that's either going to be mentioned as a content item or a child item, and it will have its own individual GTIN. All right, this is kind of the aside where we're talking about packaging accuracy because this portion here is where suppliers often make a mistake that is going to affect them in their supply chain, in their, their um, shipping and transportation. It may come back to the side of the consumer and being returned because it's not set up correctly. So we want to call out here, this is really important to do well. I mentioned kind of a spreadsheet before. I have known suppliers in the past to have something that helps calculate this or sorts this. So it's really easy for whoever's doing, doing item setup to pull and know that it's correct instead of sorting through different information, because this is really where a lot of suppliers start to get confused um, and want to make sure that they're, you know, doing that weight in, in pounds and, you know, have tie high correct. So it's really good to just have that fleshed out beforehand. All right, so I am going to do a little aside on pack packaging accuracy as this is a huge um, key step to item setup being correct and avoiding any um, revenue loss or just issues with your supply chain. So the item dimensions that um, Walmart is going to expect is the width, length, height, and weight, and then the case dimensions would be the width, height, length, and weight as well. And then you need to make sure that you're listing out the case quantity. Um, I would say if you want more information or if I I sound like I uh, am, you know, speaking a different language here, go check out um, Walmart Shipping 101. That's a webinar that we've done in the past um, that we're going to bring back in the future. But that really outlines some of those those basic elements and how Walmart expects case packs or case quantities, um, the difference between a warehouse pack um, and other measurements and how you're supposed to set up that packaging. So really important to call out. Um, another key element is tie high. So think of tie high almost as if a pallet 
um, was a apartment building. So you're thinking about how many units you can fit on a layer. So if the first floor has four packages or units and how high that's going to be stacked. So that tie is standing for your tier. So how many are in one tier? And then that high is standing for the height of each layer. And then just included here, because there, as you go on and add more elements, it can start to get confusing. Just think about how you're building your palette, how it makes sense for your product, how it makes sense for your supply chain. Um, if you haven't checked out some of our webinars on SQUEP, that is the supplier um, quality excellence program, another Walmart acronym, um, that's going to call out, you know, if you're packaging things correctly, you're going to incorrectly, you're going to get fined for it. Um, if your pallets are not correct, standard that they expect, um, and they're not, you know, maybe they need to be wrapped or um, packaged in a specific way, you'll want to make sure that you're understanding that you're compliant to those. Um, not only just to avoid fines, but to make sure that your product gets to stores, that you're not, you know, receiving a shortage when something, the way that it was received or someone moved a pallet, it messed it up. So some other considerations is just how does that, your product need to be packaged? How many of your particular products can fit on a pallet? How are you packing that with master packs or inner packs? Um, where's the skew in that? How, what does your product need? Um, how is your pallet going to be parceled out from warehouse, DC, store to customer? Are we, you know, building those pallets in a way that make it really easy um, and simple for, you know, the warehouse to understand or a, a store associate to unpack and then put on a shelf? And Walmart, this is, you know, they've just finished their, their Q4 2024. They're going to be releasing more initiatives this year um, with packaging, with tech, with manufacturing that'll be coming out and we'll make sure to communicate to everyone here. But, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're top of, no, it is top of mind what Walmart's initiatives are, what they're working on. Um, one that comes to mind that I'll just share here. If you're a SAM supplier um, side, which I'm just full of acronyms today, but I forget what side exactly stands for. It's basically a cousin of SQUEP. Um, so, you know, your packaging, PO accuracy, labeling, scheduling and transportation, but on the SAM slide, on the SAM side, that's going to be affecting um, SAM suppliers. I, I believe now, I believe it's in effect in March. So you want to know before you're actually affected by it and before you're seeing that, you know, show up on the way that you're um, numbers are presenting, especially, I know this is um, a key time for line reviews for some suppliers as well. All right. That was my packaging aside. I will say back to our regularly scheduled program. We, we talked about, you know, packaging accuracy. You added your children to the shipper and now you are, you know, adding those. This is what it would look like if you clicked on that. You'll add the GTINs and the quantity contained in the PDQ. So you want to make sure that that's correct and in line with some of the packaging that you just set up for the overall parent, um, the parent GTIN. And then you'll click submit. After that, you should be able to view the status in the activity manager. So you can go to that and see the status of the shipper. And you'll see some of these Walmart action required. So after it's been submitted, that means Walmart needs to review it. It may get passed back to supplier action at that point, or it could go to complete and you would know that that is set up correctly. Um, another call out I wanted to make here before I switch to the next slide is sending that buyer the activity ID. So that it makes it available for them to search that and then pull that into their planning. All right, so allocating item numbers. This is um, still in that parent GTIN. These are the children. Um, you've pulled those in, and then you can see that those are the Walmart item numbers. So you'll wanna choose the Walmart item number for both of those and then click submit. So you wanna make sure that those look correct um, and that you know, you're know you not seeing any errors or something confusing there. You'll also make sure that this is a good place to just do a double check because you've got those child quantities pulled in, the child DTINs under that parent GTIN, and you'll want to just check 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten places before you hit submit. So this is a, a great one to make sure you kind of have outlined beforehand, get approval from the correct teams or at least a second pair of eyes on it. So when you're setting this up, you're not spending a lot of time doing um, double or triple checks. All right, and then you'll want to name the PDQ and then submit it. Um, so what's helpful there is to um, just make sure it's something that makes sense to your team. That would also be easy for your emergent team to understand. Um, you can see the little call out that this particular program or this particular application has. It says make something memorable to help you track these items. So I would suggest just naming those and having that document in a spreadsheet that's for your internal teams so they kind of know the lingo that you're using. And again, you can go to that activity manager um, and view those and see where they are in the process. All right, and then some other tips and strategies for shipper setup. Um, utilize the shipper setup and shipper quote setup workflow. That's kind of what we did just now to sh create that shipper. And I called this out earlier, but don't create a shipper prime, which is what we just did, you know, a, a parent Walmart item number using the item setup spec sheet. So, or the, the workflow. Don't use that item setup workflow. I can even go back to that just to kind of call out. Just don't use that if you're building a shipper. Don't use that item use the shipper. I know that sounds really simple, but when you're setting up lots of different products, you want to make sure that you've outlined that really clearly so that you know, you know, you're not setting up one wrong. Um, it shouldn't take, it shouldn't make sense, but it, you know, if you have a new person on your team or someone who's new to item setup, you'll want to call that out. Um, another thing, each content item GTIN should belong to the same department. And uh, remember, content item GTIN may refer does refer to child item, so you want to make sure that those are all in the same department, um, and that each content item GTN should align with a nine-digit supplier ID chosen for the shipper prime GTIN. So they should have a, a correlation there, um, and then create the shipper prime as a non-replicable replenishable item type, just so that's not getting pulled in every time, unless it's something that you've set up with your merchant team, but that's not usually the standard for sh these shipper types. All right, let's talk about some multi-box item setup. I'm giving myself a quick time check, and it looks like I should probably go through this a little bit faster, so I'm going to do that. Um, again, we mentioned multi-box item setup, what that is. Here's a little bit more uh, context there. This is also gonna be known as an inflex kit if you come from more of, um, I hear that language more when I'm talking to Amazon suppliers, um, but that's just going to be you know, an e-commerce item that ships to customers in multiple boxes. These boxes are gonna be known as components and each component is gonna have its own GTIN. So it will feel like a little bit like a, a shipper um, where they, they're aligning and making, they have a relationship between those GTINs. The entire multi-box item is going to be identified as a sellable GTIN. So that is technically one unit, but it has components within it. Um, uh, example that I could think of is, let's say you have um, Barbie dolls. I'm thinking of Barbie from the movie and you're selling those in some kind of component where you're selling Barbie, you're selling Ken, and you're selling President Barbie, and you're selling those as one sellable GTIN as a pack, but they're packaged separately and have their own GTIN. So that's what that would look like. If you're selling a multi-box item, it's going to require a minimum of two components, which makes sense because if you only have one, that would only be one unit. It wouldn't be multi. Um, and then you can have maximum of 10 components outside of that. I don't know if anyone going outside of 10 components, I haven't seen any use cases for that. Um, if that's something you would need, I would probably have a conversation um, with your internal team or a uh, packaging expert or even your merchant team to understand and meet the goals that you need if you're having a multi-box that has more than um, 10 components. All right, and then let's talk a little bit about item proposals. This is uh, a resource you can send 
Um, your buyer and item that you're interested in listing, it would include product description, images, pricing details, packaging specifications, and this just helps to ensure accurate and up-to-date product details for both parties. I would say um, as you're getting started, um, I would, I think I, I said this before, but I will reiterate, if this is not something your buyer has used before, I wouldn't just go ahead and use it. I would try to get some clarification on best practices. Every buyer team, every merchant team at Walmart and really at any re retailer is going to be different and kind of practice different things based on the product category or just the people that are on the team. So make sure that you are using item proposals correctly um, and that it's actually beneficial for you and your merchant team. So you'll click on get started, which will help you add items um, into a spreadsheet template. Um, so you'll click um, for adding additional um, item proposals, you'll click set up new and then select item proposals. And you'll kind of get to decide what that looks like underneath. And then with item proposal set up, you just need to choose the type of item type you'll use. So that could be, you know, your item, your shipper, multi-box. Um, enter that item type in the box and download the spreadsheet. Um, if you're, you know, going to do one, an item proposal for a shipper, but you download the item spreadsheet, it's going to be incorrect. So make sure you know exactly what you're doing before you go in um, and then fill out that sheet and upload it to the system. Um, like other tools, you just take that, save that spreadsheet and then upload it into the system. There's an upload button and it will send this information to the buyer to get approval in this in the um, system. Last thing I'll say there before we get into item 360 best practices is I am not completely, and maybe if someone knows they can jump, they can share this in the chat, um, clear on how your buyer gets updated. So again, I would try to understand if that's something your buyer's checking, if it's sending them an email, um, if it's the right person on that merchant team that's getting sent that. Um, because if you have a, you know, long time, if you're waiting a long time for this and you're not hearing anything that may be a roadblock for you, um, and it will depend based on the merchant team when this is getting checked and if this is getting checked. All right, now let's get into the item 360 best practices. Um, these are things that we have found um, working with suppliers, you know, helping troubleshoot, as well as some of the rich information that is on the item 360 help docs um, and is really key to making sure you're, you know, using that application the best. I would say with any of your, um, any of your applications on Retail Link, use Google Chrome. Um, I know that there are some suppliers who have been, you know, doing this for a while and they may be using Internet Explorer or um, Safari or Firefox. What Walmart says particularly for item 360 is using Google Chrome. It processes that information better. You should have less buffering and you should have less issues when it comes to uploading your documents. Another call out is that not every process is, is supported in item 360. Um, and I would check the help docs and kind of toggle around in item 360 before you start. Um, an example is e-delivery items. You're not actually able to create a new item configuration of an existing item in e-delivery items. So you can see how in the weeds some of this information can get, but there's really helpful documentation that kind of points some of those things out and it's getting updated pretty regularly. So I would go and check though that out. And then I've called this out several times, but this is really an issue that suppliers um, make pretty regularly is following all the spreadsheet directions. So when you get into a spreadsheet um, for download to add items, this is very similar for Nova too. So if you've joined our Nova 101 or our Nova 201, you will know there's different color headings and it will give you different directions. Go ahead and familiarize yourself with the document before you start inputting information because some information is required to upload. So you'll get all your stuff in and then you didn't add that one that's required. And item 360 saying, nope, I won't accept this upload. And you're hitting you know, upload several times before you realize. Um, another just call out here is that a GTIN with any number other than zero may be invalid. So there's little checks there that you'll want to kind of familiarize yourself. And that document, as well as the help documents or some of our resources that we have, will help kind of call those things out and um, 
help you understand some of those nuances. All right, I, we got through that in time. I was a little worried on time, but uh, looks like we got through it and have plenty of time for Q&A. Oh, thank you for running through all that content, Ali. And thank you to everyone in the chat who have submitted some questions. Um, we did have a pre-submitted question that I just quickly wanted to address. And so the question is, how can I modify or delete bad information in a walmart.com product listing that was entered by a third party also, there are some of our items on Walmart that we haven't manufactured in many years. How can they be inactivated or deleted? Yes, that is a good question. And I'm going to share the um, item status code help manager in the chat, Danielle. I'm just going to paste that in there. And then um, I think that will have a lot of those answers. Um, so just to reiterate your question, if you have things that are not active anymore, what you should do is you should, you know, change that in item maintenance. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Then if you are in something like, it sounds like that person that submitted the, the question um, uses a third party to kind of upload those. Um, so you have a bunch of product attributes, go ahead and update it in your, product synchronization tool that you're using for multiple retailers and then push that um, and that should help update it. Anything you would add to that, Danielle? I know you did some research on this as well. Oh, I think you covered a lot of stuff. And like you said, that help doc really uh, is a really good resource. Uh, with regards to the inactive status, I know that after 13 months of um, an item not being um uh, active on Walmart, it automatically goes to a delete status. Um, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit. That help document has a lot of visuals that will just help you help guide you a little bit more. Um, but that is there in the chat. Thank you for sending that, Ali. Yeah. And I will say, I remember with delete, Danielle, um, it may take 90 days for something to completely be removed from the system. So I will say with lead times on item 360, I think there, there's not anything that we have information on when people get back to those things, but you can kind of find some of those in the help document. So if it's still in your system, um, it may take you know 90 days to completely remove. Thank you. Okay, so we got a few more questions coming through. Another one that we had was, will the transition to Luminate impact item setup at all since it's powered by Retail Link? That's a good question. And I will say, um, you know, please go check out our Luminate um, content that's going to be coming up. We're trying to update, consolidate all the information that's coming out about Luminate into one particular webinar where we're just kind of going through that because there's lots of little updates that are happening. Um, from what we've seen, Luminate's second portal um, with some of that data will not be affect will not be affecting item 360 mainly because you know luminate serves as a reporting tool um, and you can pull item information on your items but it it doesn't have the same functionalities right you can't do item setup you can't do item maintenance um, you can't review some of those content quality scores um, and get those insights you may see some overlap in some of the things that Walmart has in charter. So Walmart does have um, the Walmart Luminate application for Charter. I know has some of those customer insights that may, you know, have something that has to do with your content quality or your imagery or what you have online. But what I'll say to definitively answer that question is no, Luminate at this point does not look like it will be replacing or affecting item 360 in any particular way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so our next question in the chat, is the shipper workflow only for PDQs? If you are setting up an item that is not a PDQ case, should you use the item setup or shipper workflow? That's a good question. And that's probably something we can update in the future. Um, it should be anything that would be a parent GTIN. So if it is one sellable unit and it is like one item, I'm just going to be that person and bring my water bottle as my one 
um, sellable unit that would have its own, you know, UPC. Sure. If I had six of these in a shipper, I would set it up as a shipper because that's going to be that parent GTIN. That's what's going to be set up under. So that's a great question. Another great question that we um, have had come through is uh, you mentioned One World Sync, Syndigo, et cetera, as data pools. How does the data transfer from those to customer portals like Retail Link work? How often, this is a two-parter, <laughs> how often does or can the data be updated and is there extra steps needed in Retail Link or Item 360 after information has been updated in the data pool? That is a great question that you should ask on the March 27th we webinar. I'll say what I what I feel comfortable saying about that, not being an expert on um, GDSN data pools. I would say, so just to make sure I understand the question, uh, Danielle, it looks like um, they're asking about the data transfer. So how does it work? Essentially, um, let me think of a, a, a good metaphor. Essentially, you have all of your, your information and it's like copy pasting a message to a couple different people in your text. So saying like, hey, thanks for coming to my party and copy pasting it to your, your friend A, friend B, and friend C. So it's really just distributing that out, right? Um, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's able to integrate with... Um, lots of different retailers. I know most of those data integrations, they have it for Walmart, Amazon, Target, Home Depot, you know, all of your grocery. So you can really, you know, distribute that data to any retailer that you're in. And then that second part is how often can that data be updated? From what I understand, you can update that, uh, that data pretty much when you need to. Um, but I don't know necessarily the lead time. There have been issues, you know, where depending on the amount of information that you're pushing out, that it's two, I've heard two to three days it can take, but I would say, let's, let's talk, ha, have this information for the experts. I'll put this question in our prepared questions um, for Randy and Eric to ask next in a couple of weeks. Um, but I know there was a third part to the question, and I think it was about the extra steps in Retail Link or Item 360. I believe you should be able to push those and then have those updated. So that's what I would say. I, I'm not familiar with any additional steps unless you've pushed something incorrectly and it's pushed to different retailers. Then I would start with your data syndication tool and push that again to correct that information rather than going in and one-offing that information. Again, I would also just check overall to make sure that I, that information is updating. So if you have one person who's pushing to all of your retailers, I would say having them go in and just do a quality check, especially if it's a new software that you're using to make sure that data is accurate across your retailers. But there should be visibility into that um, from your, your data synchronization tool. Thank you for that insight, Ali. We have one final question, and this is from Stacy. Stacy said, I submitted a spreadsheet in item 360 11 days ago, but it's still showing Walmart action status. How long does this take? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the lead times on this uh, particularly. I would say this is a great conversation that, you know, if your merchant team is expecting it, they should they may not have visibility that it's at Walmart action. You may want to communicate that if they're they're asking for that. Um, otherwise, I would think about you know your timeline. If you, you know you've your buyer and you have talked about a shipper that you want to push out, and they have a timeline um, and it's still sitting in supplier action, I would just be proactive about communicating that with your internal team and your your merchant team of hey. Um, you know, ex shipper for this seasonal, um, you know, promotion that we're doing is is not um, it's still in supplier action. If it hits this date, we will not be able to, you know, have this completely out for you know X Y Z reasons. Um, how it's affecting, you know, the workflow that you guys are working on. So I apologize, I don't have any lead time data on how long that takes. Um, but usually for other portals like Walmart's APDP, they're pretty good at getting to you in about 30 days. I know that's a pretty wide window, especially when you're you know, working on something that probably needs to be agile. 
but I would just say um, following up and a good call out is you can join um, some of the help docs um, customer support for item 360. So if we find that link, maybe we can send that in the chat. Um, I think Danielle can probably send that. I know there's like a, a case ticket that you can file. Um, so I, I would suggest sending that and maybe that would be helpful, especially if you need that. Cause I know sometimes you're working on, on a really tight timeline. So hopefully that was helpful. Well, that is all that we have for today. Thank you all for joining and thank you, Ali, for going through that content. If you think of a question later on or would like to share any insight, please feel free to reach out to us on email or you can find us at supplypipe.com. We would just love to continue that conversation with you. So thank you for sticking around and we hope to see you on that One World Sync uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm.